Well, after two videos where we first uh, initially brought home and looked at the rough condition of this Hewlett Packard 410B and then went through and cleaned it up and did an initial test of the unit, I wanted to go into part three of the video where we look at a couple of things uh, internally and clean the switches and maybe check out a couple of resistors to verify uh, that they have not drifted terribly and document some of the inside of this unit and see if we can bring it into uh, full operation more closely. So without further ado, let's get started. So first of all, uh, one of the questions that was left in the previous videos asked what I used to clean the power cord. And you remember that the power cord in the first video was um, very dirty and even sticky and had uh, towards the base of this uh, had a, a very sticky shiny substance on it. And the answer to the question is, is I used isopropyl alcohol, starting out using simple alcohol wipes that, um, that you can get at, at a drugstore. These are saturated with 70% isopropyl alcohol. So I just simply, you know, took a wipe, uh, you know, opened, opened it up there. So they're just, you know, small little things and proceeded to wipe it. Uh, first, you know, gently back and forth, and then with a little bit more pressure, and and that's that's that worked. So you know, you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, you never really know what isopropyl might do to the substance that you're trying to clean, so you need to be cautious. That said, one of the nice things about isopropyl alcohol is that it evaporates quickly. So uh, you know, within a minute or so, the cord is dry and clean, and um, you know. Nice. So that's that's what I did there. Um, another thing that I just wanted to return to, uh, which was a comment left in the first video, and then I addressed it explicitly in the second video, is to point out that uh, this chassis is actually continuous with the ground pin on the power cord. And that's something that you need to be aware of. So next thing that we should do is open this up and take a look at what's inside. Let's get rid of the cables there. Okay, so you'll remember that this back actually has a cover, all right, that uh, removes, just kind of clips off. You push this down and the back falls off. And then inside, to get into it, there are two screws on the back, one here and one here, which I've already removed. And that then allows the unit to just separate, just like that. All right. Be a little bit careful taking this out. Okay. And so there, there we go. Now I'm going to turn this over and set it like this. Okay, Be, being careful not to squash any of the tubes. I'll turn it around a bit here so that we can see this view of it. All right, so I've gone through and cleaned this, again, mostly with uh, compressed air and uh, clean dry cloths and then uh, alcohol wipes where, um, where the other techniques didn't prove uh, effective and, and and it's cleaned up quite nicely there's just a very very small amount of just some residual rust uh, on the transformer but it's just it's just surface rust it, it doesn't go deep at all uh, and that is uh, that's entirely acceptable right so up here you can see my admitted hack of just tacking this uh, new electrolytic capacitor into place. 
the old capacitor was this, okay, and um, so this was a Sprague 4 microfarad, 450 volt DC electrolytic capacitor, okay, just, just a single capacitor, and um, just to show what time does to these capacitors, you can probably see here this material. This was electrolyte that had leaked out. Okay, um, so the capacitor had to go, and this is what I tacked on just uh, just for the purposes of demonstrating that uh, you know just for seeing if this will work. I will replace this capacitor uh, more appropriately. Very likely I'll just mount a terminal strip in this hole here and then feed the wires up through and attach them to the terminal strip and put the capacitor across the terminal strip. So let's now uh, look at the back end straight on. And uh, get a decent tight shot here. All right. So we have our transformer um, 6x4. Here's our OB2. Here's the pair of 12AU7s. Up here, capacitor holes to access different potentiometers. And this is the ballast tube here, the 6 4. This was, uh, as I mentioned in, in the previous video, this, um, I don't know much about ballast tubes. This actually has a very interesting clamp here uh, that goes around the base of this tube. Uh, and if you look at this, notice how it wiggles around. So this tube um, should be glued into this base uh, and that glue had come off uh, over over its operating lifetime and actually there are two wires to either end of the ballast that go down and should be soldered into the vacuum tube base and those wires had come out so I had to go back and identify uh, the pins to which those wires needed to be soldered and then resolder them in I don't think the uh, seal had been broken, and given the results from the last video, it uh, appears to uh, to to work uh, at least approximately correctly, if not exactly correctly. So that, this is probably uh, worth finding a replacement online. They are uh, a little bit pricey, but uh, still doable. So I will probably look into that. Um, a little bit later. All right. And then just, you know, just to kind of look at the, the workmanship here, these vacuum tubes are uh, attached and held in place by this, this spring, uh, this wire that, uh, right, that attaches like this. So it just clips over here, All right? They're affixed at the base. So this is very nice workmanship. And it really, you know, makes, makes the tubes uh, stay in place, uh, prevents any vibration, and, and, and ensures good electrical contact with the uh, pins at the base, the socket at the base. All right. Uh, and, you know, again, down here, we have power cord entrance and the fuse. Had some trouble getting that back in in the first video. That was just, um, it was just uh, me being, you know, having five thumbs on one hand. There's, there's nothing wrong with this uh, whatsoever. All right, um, let's now kind of look at this side. And I think for this shot, I will, uh, well, maybe what we should do is put it down like this and let's, uh, let's go mobile, all right? And look at, look at this. Maybe bring a little bit more light over here. Okay, so along this board here, we have a slew of resistors, 
and down in this area we have the two 12 AU7s, um, the basis for that. All right, and then up here the capacitor with my very, um, very crude, transient um, installation of a replacement electrolytic. So there's those uh, carbon composition resistors. Over here on the range switch, you see we've got one, two, three, four, um, I guess five layers of switching there. We have the precision wire wound capacitors over here. This one is 46.7 mega ohms. Uh, and then this one down here is what? That's 21.63 mega ohms and so on. And then over here we have a series of carbon composition resistors uh, as well as uh, as well as some other precision resistors down there. On the bottom we have this specimen right here and that is a selenium rectifier. I usually avoid keeping those in equipment like the plague. The consensus online is that this should probably be replaced very carefully, if at all. The voltage um, drop across these is uh, very important, and I think the uh, prevailing wisdom is that if, if the power supply section of this vacuum tube voltmeter is working and within specs when we go and, and test it at, at all the different reference points, then we should probably leave this alone. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to leave well enough alone. When these fail, they can fail catastrophically and, um, and produce a, a very noxious, potent odor. Um, that said, I, I haven't found reports of them failing in these units. So for now, I'm going to leave well enough alone. Longer term, we'll see. Um, yeah, I just don't know. All right. Uh, and then again, you know, here's the, the, the fuse and the, uh, you know, in and out wiring. All the wires are color coded and those color codes are depicted in the, uh, in the user's manual and I think on the schematic. And then here we have the base assembly for all the probe wires. All right. This actually slides out this way when you remove this screw and this screw. Uh, and what's left under there are a series of pins that look a lot like banana pins. Uh, and then so it's held in place uh, so that they make good electrical connection with these two screws. And maybe we'll look at those uh, a little bit later. All right, um, let's just uh, flip this over and we'll be right back. Okay, so I flipped this over and now uh, looking at it from what would be the left side if uh, you were looking at this straight on we see a series of potentiometers that have a little bit of oxidation, a little bit of rust on, um, on them, but otherwise look no worse for their age. Uh, again, a series of carbon composition resistors. Uh, and like on the other board, these are pretty large resistors. These are probably what, one or two watt resistors. I uh, forget what they're listed as in the bill of materials, but we can, we can go check that out. Uh, again, here's the wobbly ballast tube. And again, we see down in here, uh, some, you know, very nice soldering on the pins of the vacuum tube. Uh, down in here, that um, yellow covering on the transformer. Okay. And then here are the 
function switches uh, there with some more carbon composition and then down in there a, another precision resistor. Uh, and then this here of course is the on off switch that goes right back to the fuse. Okay, And then we're back down to the bottom and the probe wire assembly. All right. Um, so I think maybe what we'll do now is I'll reattach the camera to the tripod so that you know, nobody gets seasick. And this looks like a pretty easy target of opportunity to uh, unsolder part of this and then measure the resistance of that resistor and see if it is within tolerance. This, these are silver banded resistors, uh, I think throughout this instrument. So they should be plus or minus, within plus or minus 10% of the band values. So that's what, uh, what we'll check out next. Uh, and then after we do that, we'll go through and we'll start cleaning the, uh, the switches and, and see, see if that, um, see if that helps. Here we are. I have desoldered this carbon composition resistor and we see that the color code on here is orange, orange, brown with a silver band as the fourth band. So that should be 3, 3 times 10 to the 1, or 33, sorry, 330 ohms across there. So we will read this and see what it says. We see we have 300 and essentially 35 mm -hmm. ohms. 335 ohms. So that's pretty good within 10%. So 10% would be um, would be roughly three ohms. Mm -hmm. Three ohms. So this should be 330 plus or minus three. So this should be 300 and between 333 ohms and 330 minus three, or 327 ohms. So this is just slightly out of specification, just slightly out of tolerance. Uh, it is probably good enough uh, if the other resistors are within spec or that close to being within spec. It's probably close enough for us to bring this into calibration. So I'm going to be inclined to leave this in the circuit uh, and maybe we'll just check a couple other resistors randomly and see if they uh, they have aged similarly well. Uh, the, you know the the issue with carbon composition resistors is that they tend to drift with age, particularly um, if they are stored in humid environments. And this obviously has had moisture around uh, when uh, when it's been stored, as we saw on the with the rust on these potentiometers and the surface rust on the surface of the transformer. Uh, but that said, you know, the, you know, this is this is just maybe you know an ohm uh, or two out of tolerance uh, after you know after this being manufactured in 1961. Uh, I got the 1961 um, date, by the way, from a couple uh, date stamps on components that uh, that I didn't point out earlier. So these this has aged very well, even if it is maybe an ohm or two out of spec. Okay, uh, why don't I check a couple other resistors? Really, no need to do that on camera, and uh, I'll be back and tell you what the results of of, of that exercise is. And if uh, those look good, then we'll proceed to, to clean out, uh, clean off some of these switches. I checked a couple of the carbon composition resistors just randomly. And uh, it turned out that they were all either within the 10% tolerance band listed on the body of the resistor, as they should have been, or were 
maybe 1% additional out. So, you know, maybe they differed by 11% of what they were supposed to be. While I should just dogmatically go through and test every resistor and replace the ones that are not strictly speaking within the 10% tolerance bands, at this stage, I'm, I'm not going to do that. These are all very close, and I just want to see if I can ignore those and calibrate the unit. What I want to do now is go through and begin to clean the switches, the wafer switches and the contacts. The way I'm going to start out doing that is with some uh, just simple cotton swabs. And the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of wipe them down with isopropyl alcohol and look at what comes off and then do a uh, finishing up with some deoxit on, again, a clean uh, cotton swab. Okay, I went through and I cleaned the different switches on this assembly and on this assembly. First with uh, a series of Q-tips of cotton swabs that were uh, that were wet with alcohol and then with a set of cotton swabs that were uh, wet with deoxid. And so I think you can see here move the shadows a little bit. I think you can see just how much uh, dirt and oxidation and crud that uh, had uh, accumulated on the switch contacts. Um, there you go. So those switches are now much cleaner and as they're worked back and forth they will uh, they will probably even improve as additional layers of oxidation are now exposed and will wear off just when the uh, just when the switches are exercised. All right. <clears throat> so, last thing I want to do now is just to expose the the uh, probe uh, assembly here uh, by taking out these two screws. And I want to do this just uh, because the viewers asked to see the inside and I've given kind of a, a uh, whirlwind tour of the inside but no tour would be complete if we didn't look at the probe attachment assembly. Okay. So these two wires have uh, screws have been taken off, all right? And so you see that um, there are uh, holes into which these pins uh, fit, and they go on there. This board here, in turn, comes apart, separates from the uh, the metallic cover by removing these five uh, miniature screws and inside it's just you know it's really nothing exciting but uh, these cables attach or cables and wires attach to uh, electrically to uh, to the uh, uh, the assembly here for these jacks all right and I'm not going to take that off uh, because one it's not very exciting and two, uh, what I've done in here is, uh, as I advertised in the last video, is just uh, very rudimentary uh, to tack on some uh, temporary probes just to get this back working uh, electrically. So I will just simply uh, clean, clean up with a, again, a cotton swab with some deoxid attached. I'll just uh, you know try to quickly clean up these probes, uh, these probe jacks, and you see I'm not really getting any oxidation off of those 
whatsoever. Um, and the uh, swab doesn't really fit down into these holes, but uh, you know, I'll try to clean them off a little bit. And maybe you can see there's, there is just a, you know, a little bit of oxidation coming off of these. I wouldn't uh, expect these to be terribly dirty as far as uh, films go from whatever was circulating in the environment in the in the storage phase of this unit uh, simply because you know there's you know this isn't by any means sealed but it did make pretty good contact and so I would expect that you know these would be more issues of oxidation rather than uh, chemicals that uh, are you know in the environment maybe in smoke or something uh, you know settling in and and gumming these up uh, unlike the switches which are you know much more exposed so yeah, I don't don't know if you can see did, did get a little bit of oxidation off of the pins and the pin jacks but uh, but not too bad okay let's um, let's reassemble this and bring it back up turn it on and see if cleaning the switches has had any effect on the uh, accuracy and maybe then um, if it looks promising maybe then we'll try to adjust the, um, the adjustment potentiometers and try to bring this back into uh, if not calibration at least make it make it much more accurate than it was uh, when we saw it on the last video so let me uh, button this back up, uh, no need to do that on camera, and uh, well, I'll be right back. I've put this back together. Um, we will now turn it on and see how we fare. There's the pilot light, and we'll see the needle move. Here we go, so it goes down, and give it a few seconds and it should return, although I very likely will need to readjust the zero adjust after all that uh, handling and I probably bumped the, the pot the potentiometer from the position where I had it before so all right so we're gonna let this warm up uh, just a bit and uh, we will at the mean same time turn our DMM checker source on and um, just check that on a DMM off camera to make sure that we're still reading 5 volts and we are. I had inadvertently left the um, DMM checker on for several hours recently this week and I uh, wanted to make sure that we still had appropriate supply. Okay, so let's put this on the 10 volt range and you'll recall that because I don't have um, probe assemblies that are really appropriate, the original ones are in very bad shape. I've just tacked on. Um, in the last video I had an alligator clip making contact. Now I've actually soldered on the uh, what 22 mega ohm resistor at the probe tip. So let's um, okay, so that's zero. So let's put this on ground negative there and touch the probe tip. Okay and so on the uh, let's see we should be on the 10 volt scale so that would be the upper scale and you see that we're actually not reading anywhere near 5 volts we're reading what 2.2 volts um, so that is not at all surprising because we went through and cleaned switches and so on and so forth let's just while we're here on the three volt scale, let's see what we get. Yeah, and you see that should be pegged, but instead we're reading what, like somewhere around 2.7 volts there. 
which is interesting. If I go back to 10, 10 volt scale, I am, um, actually I misread that the first time, it wasn't 2.2, that would be 2.24, yeah, it's about 2.2 volts. I haven't had enough coffee yet. Okay, uh, so there's that. Let's, um, let's see how we're doing on uh, the resistance scale. So let's go over here and uh, set this to infinity. There we are. And if I short it out, I uh, get, well, that's kind of interesting. Should go to zero, but it's uh, it's going down a little bit past zero. So let's go uh, try to measure 100k, and um, so look at that. Let's zoom in. So I'm measuring 100k of resistance on the precision resistor on the DMM checker, and I'm on the R times 1K scale, and there we are. It's exactly 100. Let's move up to the times 10 scale, uh, times 10K, and pretty much bang on. Let's uh, just set this at uh, a little closer to infinity, and go back here, and look at that. Again, let's look at the times 100k scale. It's pretty good. And we should be right at 1, and we're just a, a hair short of 1. So that's very satisfying. Um, let's go to uh, 100, uh, 100 ohm resistor. And I'm on the times 10 scale, and look at that. So there we go and times the 100. That's just a little short of one, but notice I didn't, well, I don't, yeah, it's been pretty good, pretty good shape there. Uh, and let's finally measure the 1K resistor. And this is on the times 100, so it's measuring 10 times 100 would be 1,000 ohms. So this should drop down to one now when I go to the 1K range and a little bit out, but not too bad. Okay, so I think we are certainly in the ballpark still. The, uh, the AC probe is, is warming up, so that's still uh, working. And um, all right, so what I will attempt to do now is go to the manual and uh, see if they have a calibration procedure and we will try to walk through that and see if we can bring this into uh, more accurate operation. Well, I went ahead and buttoned up the back of the chassis for this Hewlett Packard vacuum tube voltmeter. And I've had it warming up for, well, just about an hour at this point. And we're going to go through and follow the directions in the manual and try to bring this into calibration. So the first step in section four of the owner's manual to the DC calibration process is to set the range to one volt Right, and then zero the meter with the zero adjust. Uh, and then once that's accomplished, then rock the function switch or the selector switch back and forth between negative and positive until the meter is zeroed in such a way that it doesn't uh, rock back and forth the meter when you change between positive and negative. So there's just a very small amount of rock that's probably, actually, you know, I think that was because I was physically bumping the unit as I was changing the switch. 
So I think that um, just by serendipity, we've zeroed the meter. Okay. So the next step after that is to apply one volt DC to the meter, which we will do with the Siglent power supply. So I've uh, got the power supply all set for one volt out, and here I've connected the leads. So I'm just going to turn on the voltage. And here we go. So you see that uh, it's not far off on the one volt scale, but it's, uh, it's a little off scale. And so what we need to do is to adjust a potentiometer on the back. It's R32. And change that pot until this reads exactly one. Okay, so I'm going to try to do that right now. Okay, so there's R32. And there we go. And that should be just about one volt. All right. Now, there are no other DC range voltage pots to be tweaked for the calibration procedure. So let's just change the range now and see if when I go from one volt range to the three volt range, if I still read one volt. Look at that. That's one volt. Let's select three volts on the Siglent and see if we come over to the three volt scale. There's two volts. Look at that. And three volts. Outstanding. Well, let's, uh, let's go to the 10 volt scale. And uh, right there, reading 0.3, which times 10 gives us three volts. There's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 volts exactly as it should be. Go to the 30 volt scale, and we're reading just a hair over, um, let's see, where should we be? So we, we should be on the three, right? Okay, and so there we are, we're at 10. So let's go up 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, okay, and let's just dial it up to 20. That's exactly what it should be. And go up to 30. We're reading full scale. Okay, and so on the 100 volt scale now, we're right back here, and we're measuring just a, just a tad under 30. Certainly, certainly uh, acceptable. And I'm going to max out my power supply here at 32 volts. Yep. Look at that. I've got 32. All right. Well, I could um, I could gin up uh, series power supplies and go quite a bit higher in voltage, but this makes the point that at least up to the 100 volt scale, we are very uh, well calibrated, and um, and I'm pretty confident that, quite confident that on the 300 volt scale, 
it would be similarly accurate. Let's just see if we go down to 0.1 when we go to the 300 scale. And uh, let's see, what do we get here? We get, well, let's go, let's go back down to 30 volts. On the 300 volt scale, this should be reading 0.1. And what are we getting? So here is, uh, let's see here. So we've got 300, 200, 100. So this should be 50, 40, 30. Exactly. Exactly right. So uh, up to the 300 volt scale, we're doing, we're doing well. On the 1000 volt scale, it's really too little to, uh, to measure with any sort of confidence. Okay. 30 volts. I think we can declare victory on the DC calibration. So let's turn off the DC power and go on to the AC calibration. So on the AC calibration, what the manual says to do is to bring this down to one volt. Okay. Let's uh, just adjust this a little bit. So I'm on the one volt scale. The uh, I'm supposed to turn into AC and zero it. And that's uh, that's pretty good, and we need to make sure that when we rock it back and forth between the DC positive and negative, that the uh, the meter needle does not go back and forth. And so you see, somehow uh, I've bumped the zero adjust knob so that we no longer have this balance. So what I'm going to do is try to adjust this myself in real time. So a little touchy. I probably need to go in and clean that pot manually. Okay, that's not too bad. All right, and the AC meter is zeroed, again by serendipity. So there we go. All right, and so we're on the one volt scale, and the first step is to apply one volt RMS to the AC meter. So here again, I'm going to pick, um, it suggests 100 cycles per second or 100 hertz to do this calibration at. I'm going to do one kilohertz uh, just for no very good reason at all. And um, I've got one volt RMS dialed into that. All right. So let's go back to our meter and just back off a bit. Let's hook up the RF probe or the AC probe, which is rather warm after being on for between an hour and an hour and a half. Okay, and so that's connected. Now I'm going to turn the RF out or the signal out, I should say. And um, on the AC scale, it should read one volt. It doesn't, it's not too far off. Uh, on the back, I need to adjust potentiometer R35 to bring this into alignment. So let's do that. Okay. Remember, we're reading the scale down here now, the AC scales. That's not too bad. All right. Now, before moving on to the next range, you have to calibrate the individual AC ranges. Uh, there's a potentiometer for the first several of those ranges. Uh, let's just play with this a bit. Let's go down to half a volt RMS and make sure that the meter swings down to this region. So there's half a volt. 
look at that. We are right there exactly at 0.5 volts RMS. All right. Now let's go to the 3 volt range and put 3 volts out. So there we are. Now now we're reading this lower AC scale down here and you see that again it's not quite lined up so we're going to go to R39 on the back panel okay and we're going to move that back and forth and there is just about three volts it's a little difficult to do this with the parallax but there we are okay. and again let's just dial that back to one volt and make sure that the meter swings back to this range and there we go just a hair off not too bad There we go, back up. Now let's go to the 10 volt AC range. Okay. And bring up our 10 volts. And I've hit a limitation. Uh, the siglet will only go up to 7.07 .07 volts RMS out. So what we will do is uh, adjust that to be 7.0 volts and we're now on the 10 volt range that's the upper AC scale there so we'll adjust that so that it reads 0.7 and that will just have to be good enough so that would be R40 on the back panel not too bad okay well let's uh, just pick a couple other voltages and see how this does so there's five and uh, and you can see we're not quite down to five there's six yeah, it's a little bit over six maybe what six point well it's less than it's less than 6.2 and there's 3 volts and yeah we're at 3.24 so we're at 3.3 3.4 somewhere in there uh, volts AC RMS so so I've hit a limitation because I don't have an oscillator that will produce a sine wave at uh, more than 7 volts RMS. So I'm only going to be able to calibrate this up to the 10 volt AC scale. But that said, uh, let's go back to the 7 volts. So there we are. Let's now adjust the, the frequency up and downward and show how the, uh, how the bandwidth works. So there's one kilohertz. Let's do 100 hertz. Okay, doesn't budge. Let's do one megahertz. And there we are. Seven volts. There's 20 megahertz. Just a little bit of a change, maybe. Not very much. And uh, let's see if it will let me go up to 40 megahertz. And it will, uh, but the signal went back to 3.5 volts RMS. 
a little over 3.5 and you see that we're we're not quite accurate on that scale but uh, certainly we're between well I guess what we're at 3.8 volts so again not far off so it's really important to calibrate this for full-scale deflection I wouldn't trust this meter to be calibrated on the 10 volt scale because I haven't supplied it with a 10 volt RMS calibration signal but still not too bad let's uh let's just go to three uh, volts and go down to the three volt scale and now we're at um, we're at 40 megahertz and you see it's not not too bad it's what two point 2.8, 2.9 volts. So, you know, bravo. And as we go uh, down to 10 megahertz, we, uh, at 3 volts, we go right back to the uh, 3 volt scale. Okay, uh, so now the next thing that we want to do is uh, let's turn off the RF out and let's look at the ohms scale. So there are no potentiometers for the ohms measurement. The ohms adjustment. So the way that we do the ohms is we uh, change it to ohms and we adjust the infinity infinity measurement so we set this over to infinity right there and there is a potentiometer adjustment on the back of this that you can adjust to make sure that you get to infinity if the uh, if the ohms adjust infinity knob on the front doesn't get you there, but, but that's not an issue here. Okay, so let's now look at uh, times one, and whoops, I threw it out of adjustment. Okay, so times one, let's look at a 100 ohm precision resistor. And there we are. Let's go to 10, I'm sorry, the times 10 scale. And um, it's a little bit off, but I have to let's see adjust the infinity so that we're on. And I think parallax is getting the best of me here. But so now let's go to the 100 ohm resistor and look at that. On the times 10 scale, we have exactly 10. Let's uh, go to the 1k resistor. We have exactly 100. Outstanding. All right, let's uh, flip up to the 1K, or the, the times 1,000 scale. Looks like we're still adjusted for infinity, so let's look at our 1K resistor, and we have exactly one. Let's look at the 10K resistor. We have 10, and the 100K resistor, we're measuring 100. And uh, let's go up to the 10K scale. Looks like we're still pretty good for the infinity adjust, and the 100K resistor is exactly 10. There we go. All right. So I think that uh, we've demonstrated here that our Hewlett Packard 410B vacuum tube voltmeter that we found hiding behind a bunch of rusty old equipment and dingy and dirty and in pretty bad shape at a ham fest and purchased for ten dollars pretty good investment the uh, tubes all seem to be good uh, I might want to replace that ballast tube at some point the AC probe works the precision resistors are all still good the carbon composition resistors have drifted to an acceptable amount the internal adjustment potentiometers seem to be clean and not stoved up which is not uncommon problem for these meters that have been kept in hostile environments 
and the outside cleaned up reasonably well. I do need to fabricate a sensible set of probes for this and do some more cleaning up. But overall, um, you know, this is this is a lot of fun. This this will be a very valid piece of test equipment for the bench, and um, I'm really happy I, I got it. I saw it. Okay, this is turned into a very long video. This likely will be the last in the series, although if I uh, do kind of work up the courage to take this off and inspect it and clean up the inside scale, I will, I will probably show that on video as well. And we might return in the future when I fabricate the probes and things like that. But there we go. Hewlett Packard 410B vacuum tube voltmeter. I hope you found this useful and interesting. If so, please give a thumbs up below. As always, thanks for watching.